Hello? Okay. So what I will report, the, the, the new results I will report are joint work with Ivan Anciono and Fiorella Rossi Bertoni. Fiorella finished the thesis in Cordoba last March and had a child two weeks ago. Uh, so this is the plan of the talk. First I will say something, some preliminaries, very basic, which were already said here several times. Then I will say some things uh, about Nicole's algebra of diagonal types. Then I will, ex uh, I will tell you some results about pre and post Nicole's algebras, in particular the definition of this. And finally, this is the results I want to report which I, in the paper with Fiorella and Ivan. So let me start to motivate why we are doing this. We say that K is an algebraically closed field of characteristic U. G is a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra. K is the Cartan matrix of G. N is a natural number which is co-prime to the entries of the Cartan matrix. Just this is a technical, just to say formally. And Q, so I would denote by GN the set of the group of roots of units of N of order n, of order divided n, and g prime is the set of primitives of one order n. So to this data, we have attached three Hopf algebra. The first Hopf algebra called UQG. I, I will not define formally that because it takes a lot of time and you know what this is. UQG is the small quantum group or maybe better call it Frobenius Lipschitz kernel. Associated to Q and G, which comes equipped with the decomposition of this, where UQ0 is a group algebra. I do not want to be very precise what, what group I want to take. Gamma is just a finite, suitable finite abelian group. And the important point is that UQ plus and also UQ minus is some Nico Okay, this is the first. Hi historically, it's not the first, but for me, it's the first. So this is a small u. This is small u. Then you have a big u, which And another big U, which is now calligraphic. Hmm? I, I cannot write calligraphic letters here. Okay, what is big UG? Is that the Concini projection quantum group at this parameter? which comes equipped also with another gamma or the same gamma. And and here 
what we know in this case is that u plus q projects onto u onto the Nichols algebra. This we know. And we also know that the, all the group, all the group, all the quantum group, projects onto the small quantum group. And the kernel of this is a commutative top algebra. And we know what this H is, or at least conti the continuum projects, you know. This is the algebra of functions on the <coughs> Poisson dual of the simply connected group associated to G. So there is, behind all this, there is a Poisson geometry, and the Poisson dual is ap appears here. In particular, we, know, we see that this algebra has a very big commutative subalgebra. This is not the center, the center is even bigger. This is the Hopf center, and this is the largest commutative central Hopf subalgebra. And the representation theory of this big UQ is governed by the representation theory of UQ and the geometry of this Poisson group. There are some conjectures what this representation theory should be. This I think one of these, the main conjecture was recently pr proved by Sebastianov, but I was told yesterday that Sebastianov's proof is not really complete, so still open. But, well, I do not want to enter into this, because in particular because I am not an expert. <coughs> and then we have this. So what is this? This is the Lustig quantum group at the root of unity which also, of course, comes equipped with a triangular decomposition. And now, UQ plus our Nichols algebra is embedded here. And you can take the co-kernel in the sense of Hopf algebra, this is a normal embedding, and the co-kernel is the universal enveloping algebra of G. So I, am, I, I was thinking one thing and writing another. So, so this, is, this is this, sorry. So you have an exact sequence. And what you get here is the universal enveloping algebra. And the representation theory of, well, this is with, there is another version without the plus. So these are very different versions of the quantum group. There is no big, there is no large commutative Hobbes subalgebra in, inside here. This is representation theory is well understood, but on the same time is really a very difficult. It's related to the representation theory of finite groups of Lie type, the modular representation theory of finite groups of Lie type, and it's a very very difficult problem. And well, thi this is the picture I have in mind. And what is my motivation? So now let me tell you my mo the motivation for what, what I will say now. Mo the motivations are three. I have three motivations, which I will try to explain. The first motivation is, so recall, Van Schickenberger has a list of all matrices Q, Q and J such that the associated Nichols algebra has finite dimension. So the first motivation is 
for q in the list defines So define the, the, anal the analogs of the positive part of the continuous Procesi and the positive part of list six, and study the representation theory. Of course, once you have the positive part, you can take the double and look at the, I wouldn't say representation theory, I mean the representation theory of the double. In particular, can you get from here new examples of fusion categories by some procedure that was discussed many times? The second motivation is, which is very much intertwined with this one, is understand the list of Ekenberg. So I would say we understand it better now, but not completely. And I would like also to understand the combinatorics. And I am afraid of the combinatorics of the Weil group void, and this structure which is behind the classification that Hans told us. I will recall in in, in a very informal way, this. And of course, to understand this is very intertwined with this because if you want to solve the representation theory, you really need to know the combinatorics, otherwise you will not be able to, to solve. And recently, there is a third motivation is that post-Nichols algebras play a role in the classification of Hopf algebras with finite delta G of dimension. This is a third motivation. I will explain this in two moments. Okay, so this is why I am doing what, this is what, why I was interested in doing this. Let me now go to the preliminaries. So these definitions I gave already, Hans gave, let me give them again. A braided vector space is a vector space <coughs> provided with a solution of a braid equation, which means an invertible map, linear map from B tensor V to itself, satisfying this equation. The name braid comes, of course, because of the action of the braid group. And a source of examples, by no means the only source, but the one that, that I am interested in this talk, is the category of yeter Drinfeld modules over a group, which I assume a billion, and by this I mean gamma graded gamma modules. And the braiding is given by switching using the natural, I can miss this, you switch the vectors, but if B is homogeneous, you let add the degree of homogeneity on the second time. So this is very easy, definable braided vector space. And now, let me repeat again the definition, one of the definitions of uh, Nichols algebra. So the definition is as follows. You take a braided vector space, or the related infer module over any Hopf algebra, in particular in our case this, and you take T of B and divide and by some ideal in such a way that B of V is a graded connected algebra generated in degree one. It is also a Hopf algebra in the category and as for the coalgebra structure, we demand that the primitive elements are concentrated in degree one. 
which means that what you have to do is to throw away the primitives in higher degree and what you get you, you still could have another primitive so you throw them away again and so on and so forth and at the end you arrive to the nickel structure so another this construction is like this then what I said in words you divide by the maximal gradient slope ideal generated by which is homogeneous and is uh, generated by elements of degree greater or equal than two and in general for any v we have lots we have many results uh, Hans told one one of the theories that are used to de determine in some cases when the dimension of v of v is finite or when the dimension there's a little dimension is finite and once we determine this we also need the structure of this ideal which in other words we need the relations of this ideal so a minimal set of relations of this ideal okay so now diagonal type diagonal type means that the braided vector, vector space so I, I am repeating things that were said already four or five times so diagonal type means that well I will use a notation which is the following uh, I will use this notation for a natural number and theta and diagonal type it means that you have a basis x1 is theta and you have a matrix q qij where we assume that the qii's are different from one we as to this we can attach a diagram and we assume that the dash diagram is connected i don't want to explain this in detail and the braiding is given by the usual transposition and the modification by a matrix QIJ. So if V is a finite dimensional semi simple Gettel Greenfield module, then this is your finite diagonal type. And as I already said, uh, Heckenberger gave the classification of all possible V, such all possible matrices Q, such that the dimension of V is finite. Actually, what he gave is a, is more, is a, a bit, is a larger class. He classified all yetter, all braided vector spaces of diagonal type such that the associated root system is finite. It's a, even, it's a larger class. And a remark is that because of the results I told you on Monday, uh, and Heckenberger, if the dimension of the Nicol's algebra is finite, uh, whether gamma is or not an abelian, a finite abelian group doesn't matter, if gamma is infinite also, then V necessarily is of diagonal type. Okay. Yes, but yes, but what I mean is that if you have a yetter greenfeld module over an abelian group, such that the Gerfan kill, assuming gamma abelian, hmm? but for gamma non abelian, we don't know about uh, whether this. For gamma non abelian, I don't know much about finite Gerfan kill deformation. For finite Gerf and Kill of dimension, this is not true, as I told you on, on Monday. Okay. But what I want to say is that well, this is related to the classification of uh, Kofrovinius Kof algebra. It's because you have a Kofrovinius Kof algebra, you need that the dimension of V of V is finite. And, well, this is, of course, an open question. Okay, what is the list of Heckenberger? The list of Heckenberger consists of several pages of tables and we, we tried for several years with Ivan to understand this better. And provisionally, provisionally, I will say, I understand 
is like this. There are four classes. There are four classes. The class of Cartan type, which I will explain in a moment, which is the one which I gave many talks already. Super type, which I will also explain. Uh, super modular type. And then this UFO is the class that we do not know. <laughs> so U is for yeah, an identifier. And uh, what is Cartan type? Cartan type means that the matrix Q, which has always something different from one in the diagonal, satisfies QIJ, QJI equal to QII to the AIJ for some AIJ that is chosen here in this interval. And setting AII equal to two, then this is a generalized Cartan matrix. And for this, I, let me remind you some results just to, to put this into this classificator in some context. Uh, th this class was understood many, many years ago for, uh, by Schneider and myself. And the outcome is the following. If you have a matrix of Cartan type, so we assumed in our paper that the order of QIJ, or it is a root of unity, is relatively prime to 210. Then we proved that the dimension is finite if and only if AIJ is a finite Cartan, is a finite Cartan matrix, that is a finite type. And in that case, we knew that the using results of uh, Lustig, more or less, that the defining relations of the Nichols algebra are the quantum shell relations and the power of root vector relations. Okay, so the original proof used the results of Lustig. This conclusion that the dimension is finite if and only if the matrix is finite was proved later by Schickenberger with his methods without assuming this hypothesis. So this hypothesis is not necessary by the results of Schickenberg. And the defining relations can also be described, and were indeed described by Anciono in his two papers. And in some cases, they are more involved. For instance, if you have, if AIJ is of type AN, we, these relations, you need to have another relations, and in, in that specific case, I did with that Kalesu also many years. Also, Heckenberger proved that if the order of the group is relatively prime to 210, then all possible B are of Cartan type. So, in that case, exactly. So, this says that the difficult things appear in low index. So, what is, so I, I would like to describe now, uh, I do not want to give the formal definition because it was already given by Schneider, but I want to s say in my, uh, how I think about the Val groupoid and the generalized good system. For me, to start with, you have something which I call a basic datum. So a basic datum, is a set, which is non-empty, together with a map from I, which is this set of the first theta numbers, natural numbers, to the symmetries of X. And I assume that rho I square is the identity for all I. It is possible to describe this basic datum in terms of some graph because you put as many elements as the set X, so the set of points of the graph will be X, and you put an H from I to an H I from rho I of X, from X to rho I of X, from X to rho I of X. But I don't want to insist on that. And 
in, in the, the various structures that I will remind in, in the next slide can be seen as a sort of bundle over E. And more precisely, a kind of bundle over this graph, which is defined by X and rho. So rho defines the graph, which will have loops or not, but it's a graph which is decorated. I, 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 I have it, every age has a number, which is the rho i connected. Well, and the objects are like bundles that project onto X, and the rho i will ex give us the graph and how the symmetries should work. For instance, uh, let me recall what I already said, the generalized Cartan matrix that in Katz's book is a matrix with integer values, has two in the diagonal, out of the diagonal is zero, it has a weak symmetry saying that an entry is zero if and only if its symmetry, symmetric entry with respect to the diagonal is also zero, and out of the diagonal is always non-positive. Non then a semi-Cartan graph is one of these bundles that I said before, but where each fiber is a generalized Cartan matrix. And what we assume is that if I take a fixed I, then for all J, the Cartan, let, let me maybe, so this is X, this is the semi-Cartan graph, and the condition is that if you have here some X, you have also rho I of X, and here you have a Cartan matrix, and here you have another Cartan matrix, let me put H, because I don't want Okay, so this is, and there is a constraint is that the i's row remains the same. The rest will change, but this row, where is it? Given a semi Cartan graph, we can define for every i and for every x, we can define a reflection, si of x, by these rules. alpha S i x on alpha j is this. So we have a bunch of reflections over each x. And then I take the bigroupoid, which is generated by all these guys. Therefore, an element in the bigroupoid going from a point xm to a point x1 is a bunch of reflections. So I, I understand that this reflection, the reflection x goes from x to rho i of x. If it happens that rho i of x is x again, then we have a reflection, we have a loop. Otherwise, we are moving. Okay, this is a very, very nice combinatorial object, and we don't understand it, really. We don't understand it like we understand by group, for instance, Kofferberg group. We understand many things, Probably Heckenberg and Ayaman understand more, but there's still many, many questions which I uh, cannot answer. Okay, so this is the value point. And then the last piece of information is what is called a generalized root system, which was also explained by Schneider. A generalized root system is, again, you have, again, you have a set, our basic datum, which is this set with some extra data, which you can think of this on, as a graph. And now what you have is also a bundle in such a way that over each point you have a subset mm, for every x, for every x, you have a subset Rx of z to the theta. 
And this subset is a weak version of a root system, the traditional root system, as we all know, in the sense that it satisfies a couple of equations. First, it splits in the positive part and the negative part, as in the classical case. There are no multiple roots, as in the classical case, but when you apply the reflections, you move the Rx to R rho i of x. So again, rho indicates you how to move things. So this is this, this condition. The classical case, Si will leave this fixed, but here you move it. And then you have this technical condition, which Hans already explained it, which I do not want to explain now. And then we have another definition with this Si of x, I didn't say this, but of course, if you define a Janaki root system, you define it over a semi-Cartan graph. So you need to start with the semi-Cartan graph, and you do have these reflections, and you do have the value groupoid, and then the real roots are all the roots that can be obtained from simple roots from uh, by application of the value groupoid. So if x has only one element, this is the same as the notion of real root of a Katz-Moody algebra. In, in the Katz-Moody case, the real roots are those that you get by applying the value group to the simple root. And you have also the imaginary roots. In this case, it's the same, except that what you apply is the value group point. So you can take roots from another Rx, from an, R o, an Ry, and you bring them here by the value group point. Okay, so this is the situation. And the theorem is that I, I would like to explain uh, how I see the statement of the theorem. The theorem of Heckenberger says, if the dimension of B of B is finite, then it has a, gener a generalized root system in such a way. L let me just tell you what is everything here. First of all, we define, uh, one, one defines the semi-Cartan graph at each matrix Q, there is, at each matrix Q, one defines Cijq by this rule. So this, this definition has more than 20 years, it was appeared in a paper by Rosso. Hmm? This, so this, this is the semi, this is the Eichel Cartan matrix. Then, from the matrix Q, I define, this is bold Q, this is the bilinear form in the sense of abelian groups, going to the abelian groups of invertible elements in our base field, which is, since Z to the theta is three, it is enough to define in the basis, and in the basis is given by the Cartan matrix. And with this form, we may define a new matrix, rho hour Q. So again, we have this, uh, this This idea that we are moving matrices, we are moving roots, systems, and, and so on. And the new root, the new matrix rho i of q is defined via this bilinear form and using the transposition, the, the symmetry, SI, attached to this semi cartan graph. Once we have that, then we can consider a braided vector space of diagonal type with this matrix. And then you take as the basis the basic, the basic datum of, of the situation, all these that you can reach from the original V by successive application of this rho i, of this construction. The fact that this matrix exists depends heavily on the fact that this, the dimension of this is finite, and the fact that if the dimension of this is finite, then the dimension of this is finite also, the Nichols algebra, this guy is also fine, that was explained by Schneider. So this is, uh, I am not saying that this is easy to prove everything of this, but this is what it is. And now if I take big W in X, which is one of these rho i of Vs, the set of roots, one can define this as follows, Archinkov proved, I don't know, 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, that 
every Nichols algebra or every graded Cobb algebra like this attached to a diagonal type has a PBW basis. And then you take the degrees of these PBW basis, and this is the, the root system. This is a, a, well, to be precise, this is the positive part of the PBW, and the negative part is just to take the minus element. There, there is a mistake here. And it can be shown, it's not difficult to show that uh, the PBW basis of Karchenko is not unique, but the degrees are unique. So if you change the PBW basis, you have the same degrees. Okay. And let me quickly say this. So I have how much? 10 minutes. So I, I will assume from now on that the matrix is symmetric by some technical reasons. If uh, I call U of V as B of V uh, as this guy. So U of V is the Drinsel double of the bosonization divided by some group lights. Then this is a Hopf algebra with triangular decomposition. And the theorem of Schoenberger says that, which was explained by Schneider, that there is an algebra isomorphism from T i from U of V to U of O i. And this is. Okay, then by the results of Schoenberger that Schneider did not describe, uh, <laughs> we have this. <laughs> okay, example. Suppose that you have a field of characteristic L. And let me assume that L is different from 2. I don't want to talk about L equal to two. And I take a parity vector. So I have, again, a, I have a matrix, which, well, this is a mistake here. The matrix Aij has entries in K, not in A, not in C. Mm -hmm. And I, so I have three data. I have three data. I have this matrix with coefficients in K, which has characteristic L. I have a parity vector, which is a vector which consists of ones and minus ones. And then I construct from this a vector space of space H of this dimension. And from this data, I construct a least super algebra, essentially in the same way as uh, the construction of a Katz-Moody algebra or a contra Gideon least super algebra in classical work of Victor Katz. So what I do is I take the tilde, which is the least superalgebra generated by this element with this parity. The parity is uh, the given. So you say EI could be even or odd according of T. And then you have these relations, which are the classical relations. And then you divide by some maximal idea. And what you get is called a cotrangidian least superalgebra. Again, characteristic could be positive. And these are classified. More precisely, the when G A of P is finite dimensional is known. In characteristic zero by result of Victor Katz, in positive characteristic is the work of Leides and collaborators. And we, it's not difficult to show that when the dimension of G of A P is finite, then it has an associated generalized root system. And furthermore, each of these generalized root systems appear as the generalized root systems of some Nichols algebra of diagonal type. And we know e each of them could. In particular, if L is zero, what you get is the positive part of the super quantized enveloping algebra that was studied in the literature in many places. And when L is positive, we identify many of the rows in the table of Heckenbergen in this way. Also, there are still 11 unidentified braided vector space, which are what I call UFO, that do not come from this construction. Okay, so this is the end of the preliminaries, and this explains uh, 
this picture I show with you on how to organize the list of Eckenberger. Now I want to define a pre and post Nichols algebras and explain what, why are interesting to me. So a, let me recall that if R is a graded connected Hopf algebra and V is the homogeneous component of degree one, then to say that R is a Nichols algebra means that, means two things. Means that R is co-radically graded, which is equivalent to say that the primitive element is exactly V, if you are speaking in degree one. Mm -hmm. So this is the co-algebra part of the definition. And the algebra part of the definition is that R is generated as an algebra by degree one. And these two conditions are dual of each other. And let us say that R is a pre Nichols algebra with only the first condition holds. So when R is generated by V, but not necessarily a Nichols algebra. This notion, this terminology of Nichols algebra comes from a paper of Matsuoka. And let us say that R is a post Nichols algebra when R is co-radically graded, but not necessarily generated in degree one. And I, let me picture like this. One has a map, one has T of V, which is a free algebra of V, which is an element of the category of the Riffel module. And then you have TC of V, which is the free co-algebra. And from TV to TC of V, there is a map, which I don't have time to explain, omega, which is a, homo a defined a homogeneous map, so in each component is the denoted omega n, called the quantum symmetrizer, and this map, big omega, has the property, this is an alternative definition of the Nichols algebra, that V of V is the image of omega. So this is one definition, I don't remember, by Rosso, by Schauenburg, one of them used this definition, or Voronovich, I think, used this definition to, to define what we know now as a Nichols algebra. Then what is a pre Nichols algebra? A pre Nichols algebra is somebody which is graded connected Hopf algebra and sits in the between T of V and V of V, while a post Nichols algebra is some graded connected Hopf algebra, graded, sitting in, uh, in between V of V and this guy. So this is post Nichols algebra. And we can think that on the poset of pre Nichols algebras, where the order is given by projection, so the minimum will be T of V and the maximum will be the Nichols algebra, and also the poset of post Nichols algebra, the same, which now the order is inclusion. And if the dimension of V is finite, which is essentially the case we are interested in, then you have a map, which is an IT isomorphism of posets, which to take, is to take the graded dual. And this the post Nichols algebras are relevant for the classification because the f of the following reason. If you have, say, H, a pointed Hopf algebra with group of group like abelian, then you, as we explained many times, you consider the associated graded object, and this splits like this, and this will be a post Nichols algebra. And in the finite dimensional context, the goal is to prove that there are no finite dimensional post Nichols algebras except the Nichols algebra itself. However, in the infinite dimensional case, there are such, so we need to understand them. For instance, we have the following result. If you have a pre Nichols algebra and you look at its graded dual, you have a pre Nichols algebra and you look at its graded dual, which is a post Nichols algebra, then the Gelfand-Kirov dimension of the post Nichols is less or equal than the Gelfand-Kirov dimension of V. If A is finitely generated, then they are equal. But this is not always the case. 
for instance, if you have uh, in characteristic P and take B as the polynomial algebra, then the Gelfand kilo of dimension is one, the braided dual is algebra of distributions in one variable, which has a Gelfand kilo of dimension zero. So in that case, you, you, the equality fails. Okay. So we need to know how to handle this because we don't know. And this happens because the divided powers is not finitely generated. So we will say that, well, this is a technical fact. We can control this by this lemma. Okay. And le let me skip this. And in particular, if the only Pernicol's algebra of B-dual with final Gelfand field of dimension is B of B-dual, then the same happens for, for B of B. Okay, by lack of time, I will, if you give me two minutes, I will skip this. Okay, I, I, nevertheless, I skip this because it's not what I want to say. So now I would like to say the following, something which already was more or less present here is that <coughs> B of B, I will denote it BQ now, which this Q is the matrix, which is some gothic letter. And so from now on, instead of saying B of B or I of B, I will say BQ and Q to, to have in mind that this generalizes the quantum group theory. So I, I would like to uh, introduce the distinguished Prenicol's algebras that were introduced by Ivan. And th let me tell you the short story. I asked it, uh, to Ivan, we were discussing this, and I told him we need to define this. And he told me I did already define this. They were in my thesis. See, I read your thesis. I, I, and then he pointed me in the place where he defined this. Yeah? So I did not read his thesis correctly. So I want to define the distinguished Prenicol's algebra following Anciono. And for that, I recall the CIJQs, which I already explained it. And let us say that I in I is a Cartan vertex of Q. If QIJ, QGI for all J different from I satisfies this Cartan condition with respect to this element of J. And, okay, this will say what is a simple Cartan root, but I want to have Cartan roots which are not simple and uh, roots, this is what I called R plus before, this all roots are real because the dimension of B of B is finite, and then I look at roots which are Cartan in some of the vector spaces which are away from our initial vector space, and I take it to delta plus of Q by using this element of the Waldrup hmm? So as I say, the one of the definitions of the Waldrup the of the generalized root system is that you take a positive root somewhere and you apply the value group point, you land into the positive roots or into the roots of this other vector uh, of this other point. So what I do to understand what to define the Cartan roots at Q is to take all Cartan simple roots, all Cartan vertices via the value group point to Q. Mm, and this is the sense of the definition. And with this definition, Ivan defined the following. He took the set of generators of IQ that he was able to describe, and he said, I take it.